Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's dive in uh, a little bit about the assignments and where we're going with the schedule, and then we will finish up uh, lecture two, our crash course on the history of AI, and we'll spend most of today talking about uh, embodied cognition. So assignment one, everybody have PyroSim installed and running on their machine? I see most hands going up. Okay, if you are still having installation issues, please, please, please make sure to see Atusa, the TA, as soon as possible this week. If you can't arrange to see Atusa, send me an email. I will try and meet with you. Want to make sure that nobody falls behind uh, just because of installation issues. Okay, if you do have PyroSim installed, you're over the difficult part. The rest of the assignments are trivial, more or less. Okay, so uh, let's talk about assignment two for a moment. Um, for the undergraduates, you're moving on to assignment two. Uh, assignment two is a two-parter. Uh, there are pointers into one Reddit assignment and then a second Reddit assignment. So it gets a little confusing at this point. For everyone in this course who's submitting solutions to Blackboard, you're submitting one solution, which is to assignment two. And in that Blackboard submission, there will be pointers to two Reddit assignments that you've completed, part one and part two. Okay, what are part one and part two? In the next few assignments, now that you have your uh, empty simulator up and running, the way that PyroSim works is that you send a whole bunch of building blocks to the simulator. The simulator takes all those building blocks, puts them together, simulates your robot for you, and then when the simulation ends, PyroSim will give you back sensor data, which eventually your evolutionary algorithm will use to compute the fitness of that robot and decide whether to delete it or to produce randomly modified copies of it and so on. So ultimately where you're going with the assignments is we're sort of working our way from the inside out. You're building up your simulator with the robot inside it and then in the uh, later assignments, you're going to be wrapping that simulator in an evolutionary algorithm, which is going to be sending a whole bunch of robots to the simulator and getting a whole bunch of sensory results back, computing the fitness of those robots, and so on. Make sense? That's sort of the big picture. Okay, so what are you going to be sending to the simulator? PyroSim is set up to accept six types of elements. The first one are objects. Objects. which are sort of the most obvious building blocks of our robots. These are the physical components uh, that make up uh, the robot. In this first part, you're simply going to be, uh, you're simply going to be creating a bunch of these uh, uh, cylinders. And the first thing to familiarize yourself uh, with in PyroSim is obviously we're working in a virtual environment. It's a 3D environment. So please, please, please make sure to get your X's, Y's, and Z's correct. This will make things a lot easier as you move, move forward. If we're looking into the screen or we're looking at a simulator, uh, going to the right is positive X. Going to the left is negative X. Going up above the infinite flat plane is positive z. If you ever place an object with coordinates that have negative z, you're placing that object under the ground and you may not see the object. You might think you didn't create the object at all. Very good reasons to get the coordinate system straight in your head as you move forward with PyroSim. The y-axis objects which are further and further into the screen are positive y, and objects that are moving towards the viewer are negative y. Uh, in the next few weeks, as I describe objects and joints and all the other parts of robots, I will probably get confused as well. X, Y, and Z. Straightforward, right? Okay. So part one of assignment uh, part one of assignment two, you're going to be building up objects. You'll see as you go through these assignments, a whole bunch of calls to the simulator like sim.send. So remember that sim is going to is the data structure you've, you've created in assignment one, right? That is sort of your pointer into the simulator. You can then send various elements to the simulator, for example, uh, the cylinder, and the arguments are all explained in the documentation. 
In part two, in part two of assignment two, you're going to be adding joints to the simulator. Joints, as the name implies, are like your knee joints or your elbow joints. They connect pairs of objects together. When you send objects to the simulator and the simulator starts up, you will, as long as they're in the right place, you will see those objects. When you send joints to the simulator, you will not see the joints. They're there, but they are not drawn by the graphics. So you'll notice as you work your way through part one and part two of assignment two is everything is very gradual. You'll be sending uh, one object after the other. And at each point when you add an object, run the simulator, make sure the object is where you expect it to be. Make sure that it is oriented as you expect it to be. We'll talk about orientation in a moment. When you get to part two and you start sending joints, again, you can't see them. So you need to be looking for visual clues in the simulator to tell whether you have implemented, in this case, joints correctly. And then subsequently, when you take a screenshot and send that to the TA, we are looking to see from the image you've sent or the video that you've sent that things are implemented correctly. So get in the habit early on when you can see the elements that you're sending to the simulator to just send one at a time and make sure it's doing what you expect it to do. It's easy to do things breadth first where you sort of send all the objects uh, debug your code, send it to the simulator, cross your fingers and hope for the best, and you see some random configuration of cylinders which looks nothing like what you're supposed to be seeing, and you're lost. So make sure to implement things incrementally, one at a time. So far so good? Any questions? Okay, let's talk about joints in a moment. Um, next week, we're running a little bit ahead. Next week, we will talk about physical simulators in more details, but I just wanted to give you a, four, a few details now that you're already implementing your own, uh, you're implementing your own physics engine. As I mentioned, when you're adding in joints, you're connecting pairs of objects together, like the two cylinders that you see here, the white cylinder and the red cylinder. When you send a joint to the simulator, you also send a bunch of arguments to describe the behavior of that joint. One set of arguments tells the simulator exactly where the joint is supposed to be. And as you would expect, where it is supposed to be is exactly at the intersection of these two objects, not unlike the fact that your elbow joint lies between your upper and lower arm. Another important set of arguments you're going to send when you describe the joint is the joint normal. And the joint normal is going to contain information about how these two objects are being connected together. So going back to high school geometry uh, for a moment, a normal is a vector that sits perpendicular to a plane. A normal is a vector. So you're going to be sending in, you're going to be sending into the simulator a joint normal, a vector, and that vector is going to describe the plane through which the pair of objects are going to rotate. So at this point in the course, we're just going to be working with rotational joints, which take two objects, and when you create the joint, they weld those two objects together, and depending on the joint normal, they describe how those two objects rotate relative to one another. Make sense? Okay, so if I extend my arm for a moment and I create the joint normal, which is facing towards you, what is that vector given the coordinate system we just introduced? Let's imagine my elbow is at position x equals 0, y equals 0, and z equals 0. And I place a joint normal that is facing towards the observer, towards you in the virtual world. What is this vector? It's in the y plane, right? So remember y minus zero points towards the observer. So I would define this vector as x equals zero, y equals minus one, z equals zero. For the moment, the magnitude of this joint normal doesn't matter. So I've defined the vector that's pointing towards the observer. So the plane that is uh, orthogonal to that normal is the x, z plane. So far so good? 
So that would cause these objects to rotate like this. If I were instead to take the same pair of objects, place the joint at exactly the same posi position, 0, 0, 0, and define this joint normal, what is this joint normal and how do the two objects rotate relative to one another? Exactly. So now we have a joint normal that's x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals, I've already forgotten, positive 0, right? Which means that the two objects are going to rotate through the x, y plane. Yeah? Okay. As you'll see, as you start to build up your scissor bot here, this thing will scissor along the ground for you when you get it working. Once the pair of objects start to move in the physics engine, then obviously they're not restricted to the xy plane uh, anymore. You're just setting the initial conditions. You build where the objects start and where the joint normal starts, which dictates how the objects are going to rotate relative to one another to start. And then once the physics engine starts going, it does all the rest of the work for you. And we'll talk more about that when we get to our discussion of physics engines next week. So far, so good. Those are objects and joints, which you're going to be tackling uh, this week. You're going to obviously be working in three dimensions. So uh, when you get to objects, and especially when you get to the joints uh, assignment or part of the assignment, I would suggest either with uh, pencil and paper or Google Draw, whatever you're more comfortable with, you start to create engineering sketches like the ones that you see here, which will help you work out all the X, Y, and Zs for the objects and joints. If you haven't done an engineering sketch before, it's a pretty straightforward idea. You're obviously trying to figure out where to place objects in a three-dimensional uh, coordinate system. So you start by creating 2D cuts through this 3D environment. For example, if we're looking from behind at this scissor bot, we've got the back view, and if we're looking from the back, that means we're looking at the X, Z plane, and there's the back of this scissor bot. At, at the same time, we can imagine looking at this same set of objects from the side, which would be the Y, Z plane, and finally, if we're looking from above, we're looking down onto the X, Y plane. So these are three different two-dimensional views of the same object, uh, the same set of objects. So as you can see here, I've started to sketch in my white and red cylinder, and I've started to annotate onto this engineering sketch the position of the uh, the white cylinder here, it's at x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0.6. And um, in this case, we're going to be working with capped cylinders. They have little half spheres on the end of e each cylinder. So in order to calculate the height of a cylinder that has a height of 0.5, I need to take into account the 0.1 radius of uh, the cap of the cylinder all explained in the in the assignment but again with pencil and paper uh, and working with an engineering sketch you can sort of work out the kinks of exactly where everything needs to be type in those numbers to your code and it'll definitely speed up the the construction of your robot in the simulator okay any questions about that Okay, graduate students that are running ahead, um, you've implemented objects and joints. The next two components that you need to tell PyroSim about are sensors and motors. We talked about this a little bit last week. Obviously, the sensors give the virtual robot information about its virtual environment. That information flows into the sensors and will eventually flow out to the motors. The motors connect to the joints in a similar way that the joints connect to the objects. Motors send forces to the, to the joints and cause the joints to rotate. As you'll see when you get to part two of assignment two, when you're implementing joints, you're going to be creating what's known as a ragdoll uh, robot. You're going to connect objects together with joints, but you're not going to be sending any forces to the joints, so the robot will just flop around and fall to the ground passively. 
Once we add motors, the motors start to add forces like your muscles, which will cause the robot to move. And once we connect sensors to motors, the robot will start to move in response to what it senses in its environment. The robot can't do that yet because we have not yet connected sensors to motors. We'll do that in a later assignment when we start to add neurons and synapses to your robot. And the neurons and synapses provide connections from the sensors to the motors. And we close the loop, which we talked about last time. The robot receives sensory information from its environment. The values arriving at the sensors propagate down through the neurons and synapses to the motors. The motors apply forces to the joints. The joints cause the objects to start moving. The robot moves and changes its relationship to its environment, which causes a change to what it's sensing causes a change to its motors, and around and around that loop we go. We go through that loop a hundred times, or a thousand times, or ten thousand times. In the simulator, the robot does its thing. Simulator ends and sends back all of the sensory information that the robot recorded during its quote-unquote lifetime. That's the inner loop of your code, and we're then going to wrap that in an evolutionary algorithm later in the semester. Any questions about all that? All good? OK. So back to the schedule. Uh, undergrads, you're working on assignment two. Uh, graduate students, you're, you're moving on to assignments uh, three and four. We'll talk about embodied cognition today. And then on Thursday, we'll start in on the second theme of the course, which is the tools of the trade. I just. Uh, very briefly talked about physics engines. We'll come back to that in more detail next week. Um, I will not be here this Thursday. You will have a guest lecturer who will walk you through artificial neural networks. Again, there are other courses here at UVM about this topic. <coughs> We're going to talk about it just enough for our purposes of using a neural network to control our robot. And the third part of this second theme is the evolutionary algorithm itself. OK, that's where we're headed. Let's get back to where we left off last time, which was uh, finishing our discussion of the short history uh, of AI. And just as a reminder, we started several centuries back with Descartes, who forced this distinction between body and brain, which you will see cropping up many, many times during our discussion this spring. We then jumped ahead to the 1930s with Alan Turing's Turing machine which then got built during the Second World War in physical machines and gave rise to the computer era. We then jumped forward to the 1950s when the, this idea of using these new things called computers, could we actually make smart computers? And obviously we are still working on that one. We talked about uh, the 60s a little bit and the uh, first attempts to make chatbots and language and start to build some of the components of intelligence into our computers. Most people would argue that an important element of intelligence is understanding language and being able to generate it. We're still wrestling with that one. Talked about uh, the Turing test. It turns out it's notoriously difficult to precisely define intelligence. Some people, Alan Turing included, felt we would never be able to define intelligence. The best we can ever do is point at things and attribute intelligence to them if they act intelligently. But John Searle in the 1980s, a philosopher, had a problem with this because he felt you could imagine systems like the Chinese room that passes the Turing test but is clearly not thinking. Yes? So how do proposed Turing tests deal with like, people who have different familiarities with like, chatbots and that kind of thing? Because there are definitely a lot of bots that would fool a lot of people. But if anybody else in this, anyone in this room saw it, they're like, oh, it's obviously a bot. Because it has certain Absolutely. The Turing test is an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. We can ask lots of questions about the Turing test, like, for example, who are the judges? Right? You may be able to create a bot that's able to fool some people some of the time, 
But creating a bot that can fool most of the people most of the time is still beyond our, our grasp, right? So best to think about the Turing test not as, not as a piece of code that either fails or passes the Turing test. It's how long it can go fooling a larger and larger group of people. Okay. So John Searle had a problem with the Turing test. He said, here's the Chinese room. The room itself is clearly not thinking, but it passes the test. For some people, however, they feel that uh, the Chinese room experiment actually sort of uh, blew up in Searle's face because the Chinese room, although it doesn't look like it's thinking, it's passing the Turing test. And how is it any different from the little pieces going on inside a nervous system? Any one neuron or synapse or small group of neurons and synapses does not itself think. But if we look at a human mind in its entirety, we often point at it and say, that person is thinking because they're responding intelligently to my questions. So the Chinese room, for some people, is capable of thought, even though it's made up of elements that themselves are not smart in the same way that human brains and animal brains do. Whether or not you agree with that, it's an important uh, argument ongoing in the history of AI. Okay, let's move forward to the 1980s. We're going to switch now and start to think about embodied aspects of AI. And as the name implies, what is the role of the body in being able to think? Back in the early 1980s, uh, Valentino Breitenberg was not a roboticist. He was a neurophysiologist. He studied the brains of organisms. Um, he focused on one organism in particular, which is the fruit fly. Uh, if you live in student housing, you're probably very familiar with this animal. Uh, if you leave any rotting fruit anywhere, uh, eventually these fruit flies will appear. If there was a rotten apple in the back of the room there, and I were to let some fruit flies go, they would eventually make their way to the back corner. How does a fruit fly, which is about the size of a head of a pin, actually find the fruit? Early on in the 1970s, when uh, Breitenberg was doing most of his work, there were a lot of theories reported in the literature about how uh, insects uh, navigate through the air to find uh, a food source. People had theories that the animals were performing differential calculus uh, while on the fly. Meanwhile, Breitenberg was actually dissecting the nervous systems of these organisms. The organism as a whole is about the size of a head of a pin. You can imagine how small the brain of a fruit fly was. Breitenberg became increasingly convinced that it's unlikely the fruit fly is performing differential calculus while it's looking for the rotting apple. So he started to play with pen and paper about alternate theories and started to play the game of how simple a neural circuit could you formulate that would allow an organism like a fruit fly to navigate and find a mate or a food source or navigate away from a predator. And his musings on the subject eventually gave rise to this book that he wrote called Vehicles. Um, if you're interested in the history of AI and robotics, I highly recommend it. It's written like a, a, a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was vehicle one, dot, 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 chapter two, then along came vehicle two, dot, dot, dot. And he uses the term vehicle, which for us in modern days implies a machine. But the term vehicle is meant to be sort of a placeholder. A Breitenberg vehicle could be a Lego robot, could be a fruit fly, could be a human, could be a machine made out of frog cells, doesn't matter. As long as it has sensors and motors, or if we're talking about a biological machine, sense organs and muscles, and it has a little bit of, abil of ability to translate incoming sensory signals into outgoing motor signals. Okay. Valentino Breitenberg made a number of points in this book, but for our purposes today, the main takeaway from his book is that with exceedingly simple robots and internal circuits, you could get relatively rich and complex uh, behaviors if you put it in the right environment. So let's start with vehicle one, very simple. We've got a little body, one wheel, and one temperature sensor. That temperature se sensor is connected by one synapse or one wire, 
to the motor. Let's imagine, uh, let's imagine that we place this vehicle one in a, in a pond. Uh, it's restless, you would say, and does not like warm water. Uh, it's quite stupid since it's not able to turn back to the nice cold spot it overshot in its restlessness. Anyways, if you saw this little critter moving around in a pond, you'd say that it's alive because you've never seen a particle of dead matter moving in this way before. Why does vehicle one slow down when it's in cold? Because we'll imagine that there's just a proportional connection here. The lower the temperature, the slower the temperature sensor fires and the slower the wheel turns. The more heat, the more strongly the sensor fires and the faster the wheel turns. Why would an accomplished neurophysiologist use language like this? It's alive, it doesn't like the cold. Seems like very strange language for a sober scientist to use when describing this machine. Because he was basically just thinking that fruit flies are basically doing that. Possibly, maybe this is what fruit flies are doing. Let's have a look at vehicle two, which Breitenberg called the aggressor. I think we talked about this briefly last week. Two light sensors on the front of the vehicle, two wheels on the back, and there are uh, contralateral connections here. Contra meaning across, and lateral meaning across the body, across the side. So the left sensor is attached to the right wheel, and the right sensor is attached to the left wheel. And we'll imagine, given these little plus signs here, that they're proportional connections, meaning, meaning more, the, more strongly the sensor is firing, the faster the wheel turns. OK. If we were to chase after this aggressor, or we were to place a light source front left of the aggressor, it would turn slightly towards the light. Why? Because the back right wheel will be getting more power. Exactly, right? Pretty straightforward. There's more light falling on the left sensor, so the right wheel is gonna turn faster. And at this instant in time, the robot is gonna turn slightly towards the light at the next time instant, what's going to happen? The robot is now turned a little bit towards the light, and it's also a little bit closer to the light. <coughs> what happens next? The left wheel is going to start getting power, causing it to go towards the light source. The left, so it's turning towards the light, which means even the left, the left sensor is even closer to the light now. So the right wheel is going to turn even faster. So it's now turning a little bit faster towards the light source. Eventually, it's going to turn until it's facing the light. What happens when it's now facing the light dead on? What happens next? Both wheels are going to go at the same speed. It's going to get closer to the light. What happens at the next time instant? It's still facing the light head on, and it's closer. It would be a little bit more detail. What else is happening aside from just turning and facing the light? It's going to get faster, right? It's closer to the light, so there's more. The wheels are turning faster. It's going to accelerate, accelerate towards the light, and if it's a naked bulb, it'll smash into it and destroy it. If you read Bradenburg's vehicles, this is vehicle uh, actually 2A, the aggressor. It hates light with a passion. It will destroy any light bulb placed anywhere near it. Yes? What would happen if you lift the connection so that the right goes to right and left goes left? Would it like this? Right? Yeah. Okay. This is vehicle 2B, which is exactly what you just described. The only difference between 2B and 2A is we now have ipsa lateral connections, same side, left sensor connected to the left. Uh, wheel, right sensor to the right wheel. Let's now come at vehicle 2B with a flashlight front right. What does the robot do in this case? It's going to turn away from the light, right? More light is falling on the right sensor, which means the right wheel is going to turn faster, and it's going to turn a little bit away from the light. 
Let's imagine for this robot that the two light sensors are omnidirectional. So at the same time that it's turning away from the light, it's still receiving photons from the light which is now behind it. What happens at the moment that it turns a little bit away from the light? How does 2B behave at this next time step? It would, it would keep turning away from it? It's going to keep turning away <laughs> indefinitely? Until it's directly behind it? Until it's directly behind it, right? The moment the light is directly behind it, there is the same amount of light falling on both sensors. So it's going to go straight, right? It's going to start going away from the light. If the light is exactly in front of it, which is possible in a physics engine, but not in reality, there's always going to be a little bit of asymmetry, and it'll turn away and magnify that difference, right? OK, so it's facing away from the light, moving away from the light. What happens at the next time instant? It's going gonna, it's gonna to stop or slow down, right? It's moving away from the light source. <coughs> Less light are falling on the sensors. It's going to slow down and eventually come to a stop until you chase it with the light from behind. The minute you chase it from behind with the light, what is it going to do? It's going to run away. This is the coward. Right? It's fearful of light. It will run away in terror from the light source. Again, if you read Breitenberg's book, he describes the abject terror that this vehicle experiences, unlike the unmitigated anger uh, and rage that this one feels about all things light. Why would a very accomplished scientist talk about these little critters loving and hating? Absolutely, you can graft on or attribute animal or human emotions to these things, right? We're, we, are, we are privileged because we know what's inside these creatures, right? These two contralateral or two ipsilateral connections. Imagine, though, that you don't see those wires. All you do is see one of these things running around in a pond or some student out in the hall chasing a Lego robot with a light source and it's after, chasing after the light, running away from the light. Of course, if you see it's a Lego robot, you might say, okay, it's a machine. It doesn't love. It doesn't uh, hate. You can imagine, again, how we could uh, extend this to, to three dimensions and imagine a flying vehicle. And where now it doesn't have two light sensors, but it has two odor detectors. And you can imagine how it would be relatively simple for it to basically swim up the stream of the odor plume that is being given off by the rotted fruit. And with very, very simple connections, something very, very small and simple would be able to, to find the food source. Now, we still don't know exactly what's going on in the head of a fruit fly, but it's probably not doing differential calculus because it doesn't need to, right? Okay, so that's point number one. Point number two is this idea of attributing animal or human emotions to these simple creatures. If you read, uh, if you read the book, you, as you can probably imagine by now, you'll find yourself smiling to yourself thinking, well, this is kind of silly, right? Of course, these things don't love or fear. Only animals and humans do. We're different, right? Obviously. Everybody okay with that? We're not like these simple vehicles. Why? What's the difference? More synapses, right? So we have about 10 to the 14 synapses, which is a lot. But our computers are now reaching that, that level. We could make, in theory, a robot with 10 to the 14 contralateral and ipsilateral connections. And clearly, we could make it run towards the light or away from the light or anything else we wanted. 
Is that the only thing that separates us from the vehicles, the number of synapses? Because if that's the only leg you're going to stand on, modern computers are going to knock that leg out from under you very soon. The way they're connected is also obviously important. The, the way, way they're connected? I think in theory, since we can make that many connections with a computer, maybe it is possible to make you know, artificial intelligence with that, but we just don't know how to connect the dots. Maybe. Is there some magical connectivity of these 10 to the 14 artificial components that will give us something that doesn't just look like it loves and hates and fears, but actually loves and fates, loves and hates and fears like we do? Who knows? For most people that end up finishing his book, you're often left with an unsettling feeling, which is what exactly is the difference between us and them? It's not so immediately clear. So, which again, from uh, Bradenburg's point of view, takes us back to philosophy. What really is the difference here? Is there a separation between the dumb body and the thinking stuff going all the way back to Descartes? Maybe there isn't a distinction. Maybe there is only one thing. Hard to say. Okay. Again, one of the interesting things about studying robotics, it's a very technical discipline, but also helps you to think differently about the nature of intelligence. Okay, let's move further into the 1980s. Uh, we saw Eliza from the 1960s. A lot of people from the 60s through to the 80s had a problem with Eliza. The coders that had a problem with Eliza, there's a whole bunch of if-then-else statements. And as they were trying to make better and better chatbots, the code was growing to tens, hundreds, thousands of if-then-else case statements. It was getting pretty messy. Is there a better way to do this? Starting in the 1980s, there was the, this recognition <coughs> that the brain probably doesn't work this way. The brain seems to be a parallel processor. It's not checking one if conditional after another. There is massive amounts of data coming in on the different sense organs, and all that data is being processed in parallel. So there were attempts, to, it, starting in the 1980s, to create smart machines, not by putting together a bunch of if-then-else statements, but instead to create simple computer programs that were models of animal and human nervous systems, which we all know today as neural networks. We start with our inspiration, which is the brain. And in the neural networks you'll be building in this course, they're a little bit closer to the human brain, just in the sense that the input layer of the neural network is going to be receiving information from out there, which for our purposes will be the virtual world of our virtual robots. That sensor data is processed in parallel using a bunch of contra and ipsilateral syna uh, connected synapses. And the values that are arriving at the output layer of the neural network are just numbers. And those numbers are going to be interpreted by the motors as forces. So in essence, the neural network is going to be sending signals to the body to pull and push on the joints and cause movement. For most of neural networks that, that people have seen, um, we usually abstract away the sensors and motors and just imagine an input layer and an output layer. Um, this was worked, uh, work started in the 1980s. Uh, Marvin Minsky pointed out a fatal flaw with some early neural networks in the 1980s, which caused the first AI winter, or possibly the second, depending on how you count. Neural networks became uh, a subject that no researchers would touch for decades. But a few researchers kept working on neural networks. They were laughed at by their colleagues. They worked on it for about 30 years until in 2006, they published a series of papers showing how to do neural networks right. And in order to try and cast off all the, the bad press from the previous 30 years, they rebranded neural networks as deep networks. Why deep? Because in deep neural networks, we have a lot of layers between the input layer and the output layer. Okay, again, this isn't a deep learning course. Just for our purposes, we get a whole bunch of data that's arriving on the input layer. For example, a picture of a face. In deep neural networks, the early layers, the ones that are closer 
to the sensors, than the, closer to the input layer than the output layer. They're receiving local views of this photograph of a face, and they're recognizing or lighting up when they recognize certain building blocks of a face, like diagonal lines, noses, ears, and so on. Later neurons, which are deeper in the network, are getting information from a greater subset of the input neurons. And they are lighting up when they recognize more global features, like the face of a human or a cat. And then at the output layer here, we can imagine just two neurons. One neuro this neuron lights up if the neural network thinks it's looking at a human face. This neuron lights up if it thinks it's looking at a face of a cat. Okay, so you probably heard of deep networks. That's the connection here. Okay, so there's been sort of a 180 degree turn in the field of AI where neural networks were seen as sort of a, the wrong way to go until now we are in our deep AI summer being powered by deep networks. Okay. So, uh, again, you can go read about uh, AI winters and summers, depending on how you count, there's been two or three. There's a lot of interesting speculation at the moment on whether a new AI winter is upon us. Uh, a famous roboticist from the 1980s wrote about the earlier winter, um, and he said, many researchers were caught up in a web of increasing exaggeration. Their initial promises to DARPA for funding had been too optimistic. We promised more than we could deliver, but of course, once you've promised something, you can't promise ne something even less the next time around. So researchers get caught up in the hype cycle of having to promise ever greater uh, advances, which they don't deliver on, which causes the funding agencies to become cynical of whatever the current technology is, like deep networks. They yank all the funding away, and we plunge back into an AI winter. Whether that will happen in the next few years, who knows? Okay, so that brings us up to the present, um, where we'll be spending a lot of time in this course talking about state-of-the-art in robotics. There are other courses that focus on state-of-the-art uh, in neural networks. If you look at sort of these two fields together, thanks to Descartes, they're broken into bodywork and brain work. So for our purposes, when I mention AI in this course, that's going to be short uh, for naked neural networks. Neural networks that have no body, they sit and wait for a human to supply a photograph or an audio track or a YouTube video. Then they do their thing and give the information back to the human. They're passive and naked. They don't have a body with which to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Within the field of AI, there's connectionism, which is just another term for this idea of trying to create smart machines using connections of neurons and synapses. A lot of that work draws its inspiration from neural science. So there is sort of a continuum between those that code up neural networks and neural scientists that scan human subjects in brain imaging devices and then everybody in between that tries to take inspiration from human brains and build it into code, and vice versa, neural scientists who see the successes that are being made with artificial neural networks, which suggest what to go looking for in biological brains. So there's this connection from AI and neural networks through connectionism to computational neuroscience and then neuroscience itself. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Related to artificial intelligence are these AI methods like evolutionary computation, which we'll talk about, data mining, machine learning, the field of artificial life. They're all kind of related, and we'll talk about them in more detail. However, in this course, we'll spend most of our time talking about embodied machines. So machines that somehow don't have to wait for humans. They can push against the world with their motors and generate new sensor data and use that, set, that motor and sensory repercussion loop to learn about the world. Hey, I did this and that happened. What does that tell me about the stuff that's out there? That's embodiment, which we'll talk about shortly. Okay, uh, industrial robots, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. They're pre-programmed, they're not uh, very interesting. Biorobotics. This is where we take a particular animal, like uh, an insect or a dog or a human, 
and we try and build it out of metal, so we're inspired by a particular species. We'll spend a little bit of this time uh, in the time in this course talking about developmental robotics. So developmental psychology is the branch of psychology that looks at child development. How do relatively helpless infants gradually learn about their world and become capable adults? That's the, that's the field of developmental robotics. So can we look at a robot as a child that's an initially help, helpless? Can we give it some help to get going and eventually become independent? We'll talk about swarm robotics. So in a similar way, can we make, rel uh, can we make robots that are relatively helpless on their own, but if they're able to work with their neighbors together, they can do something that would be beyond the ability of any one robot. And finally, of course, we'll spend most of our time talking about evolutionary robotics. Okay, so again, we're now gonna switch and talk about embodied cognition and this divide started by Descartes hundreds of years ago between embodied and non-embodied approaches to intelligence. What are the pros and cons of these two approaches? Any questions before we move on? Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do in lecture three here is, as I've already mentioned, it's very difficult to define intelligence itself. What we're gonna do instead is look at a number of building blocks of intelligence. So going back to the Turing test, you can often point or observe uh, an animal, a human, or possibly a machine, and say that machine is understanding language and producing language. That machine is planning ahead. That machine is successfully recognizing patterns in its environment. If we can build a machine that is able to exhibit more and more of the components of cognition, then maybe we would attribute uh, intelligence to it. So let's look at a couple of building blocks of intelligence. And to illustrate this idea of embodiment, we'll look at non-embodied approaches to try and build that building block into a machine and embodied approaches. So let's start with pattern recognition. Obviously, if we want a machine to successfully navigate our world, it's going to have to be able to recognize chairs and tables and doors, people, roads, weather patterns, and so on. It needs to be able to see things in its world. People have been trying to get computers to see well for a long time. This is the, the field of computer vision. It took a long time to get this right. Deep networks were a part of solving this problem. We can now, if we give computers enough photographs, if we give the computer a million photographs with Marilyn Monroe in it and another million photographs with Marilyn Monroe not in them, the computer will be able to eventually recognize Marilyn Monroe. Let's make this even simpler. Let's focus on the problem of image segmentation. We as the humans want the computer to recognize something in the image and to begin with, the computer has to be able to segment or separate the background from the foreground. Even that is a difficult thing to do. Even in this relatively simple image where Marilyn is up against a black background. Part of what's made difficult here is her dress. We've got some uh, uh, translucency here. It's a tricky problem. Imagine you're the computer, and I was to give you a huge spreadsheet of red, green, blue values for every pixel in this image. You wouldn't be able to see Marilyn Monroe either. Right? Hopefully, most of you recognized her almost immediately. It's very easy for us to solve this problem. In the history of AI, it turned out to be notoriously difficult. They thought they would solve this in a few weeks of the summer of 1956. It took until about the late 2000s until it was finally solved. It's very difficult because most of the approaches to this were non-embodied. People have been trying since 1956 to feed photographs into a computer and have the computer spit out Marilyn Monroe or not Marilyn Monroe. Why did people spend so much time feeding in photographs? Because they were infected by Cartesian dualism. The body is not important. I, I can't trust it. The only thing I can trust is the little person sitting inside my head that's looking out at the world, asking questions, recognizing what's, what's out there. So um, 
Roboticists have also been trying to solve the same problem, the pattern recognition problem, but from an embodied point of view. And in many ways, the moment you bring the body into this as a tool to help the machine recognize patterns in its environment, the problem becomes much easier. And that's one of the main lessons I want you to take away from this course about embodied cognition. The body is not an obstacle. It is not holding up the brain or the mind or the soul, if you like. It is a tool. It is a, it, as important, if not more important, than the brain. How is it a tool? Well, uh, BabyBot, who you see here, or COG, actually, this is COG, COG illustrates this relatively well. So uh, how does COG work? Well, as you can see, COG has two cameras, the eyes, and COG has one arm. Those of you that have taken my HCI course, you probably remember COG. COG has two eyes, one arm. We're, so we're gonna get two continuous visual feeds back from the two cameras. But in this case, we're gonna throw away most of the information in those two video feeds. The only thing we're gonna keep at each pixel in both image streams is whether there was motion at that pixel in the last time instant or not. So that's illustrated on the right hand side here. All of the pixels that are grayed out, COG has not seen any motion there for the last tenth of a second. And just this blob here, does COG, has COG seen motion in the last tenth of a second? Okay, seems like kind of a strange thing to do. You have all this information coming in through the eyes of COG and we're gonna throw everything away except motion or no motion at each pixel. So far, so good. This is not an evolutionary robotics experiment. This is a developmental robotics experiment, developmental psychology. We're gonna treat COG like a helpless infant. We're gonna assume that although COG has a body, it doesn't know how to use it yet. Not only does it not know how to use its body, it knows little to nothing about its body and the outside world. So if you're a helpless infant or a helpless infant robot, what can you do? Well, you have a body, so you can at least start moving. So what BabyBot, or sorry, what COG is going to do in this case is just start sending random commands to its motors. Doesn't know much. If you don't know anything, act and see what happens. So, Baby uh, Cog starts sending uh, commands to its motors, and as it does, it happens to send some uh, commands that bring its arm into its visual field, like you see here. And the moment Cog sends those commands to the arm, this big blob appears in its field of vision. <coughs> Cog stops sending commands to the motors because it's kind of surprised something happened. What happens at the moment that COG stops sending commands to its motors? It stops seeing movement, right? Suddenly the blob disappears. Oh, that's interesting. Send random commands again, the blob appears. Stop, the blob disappears. Back and forth, back and forth. BabyBot is already pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. And it's already detected a pattern. When I do something, this blob shows up. This blob of motion shows up. What can COG conclude from that? It's not much, but it's something. The object's only moving because COG is touching it? It's only moving. It's not touching anything yet. It's just its arm. It's only seeing its arm. It's not even touching the fruit that's, that's here yet. It hasn't seen the fruit yet. There's just this blob that appears whenever it moves. What can, what can Cog conclude from that? The motion of his body is equivalent to what he sees. So baby, uh, Cog says, all right, there's this phenomenon. I move and I see this blob. So I'm gonna call this blob me. That's me. So, Cog is already tackling an important element of cognition, which is the self-non-self -self discrimination, right? This is me, all this other stuff I don't know about, but it's not me, right? And the definition of me is not hand-shaped or claw-shaped things. It has nothing to do with the pattern itself, 
It has to do with the nature of the sensor motor feedback loop. I act and I see this kind of blob. So the very beginnings of cognition that are getting started in COG here are not so much about Marilyn Monroe or patterns that are supplied by humans. They have to do with a pattern that unfolds over time. And you can already see that these two different approaches to pattern recognition cause us to think differently about what intelligence is. Right? For most people who work in embodied cognition, cognition is not about sitting passively and absorbing information from the world. It is an active process. Push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. We'll see that many, many times in this course. Okay, so uh, COG has mastered self, non-self. It knows the blob is self, and it's happily watching this blob-shaped part of itself move around, but then some, suddenly something unexpected happens. By sending in random commands, suddenly the shape of the blob changes. There is this additional round blob that appears at the end of this blob. Cog stops, it's surprised. What can it conclude from that? It stumbled upon something new in the world. What can it conclude about it? It's not part of self. It's not part of self. Whatever this thing is, it's not self. Why? Why is it not self? What is happening in this sensor motor loop that tells Cog this is not self? So if it only moves when, it only sees when something's moving in its field of vision, and it touches this thing and it stops, and it suddenly sees nothing, it didn't tell itself to see nothing. Something out, something interactive with made it see an effect that it didn't create itself. It's, exactly. So it sort of started this process, right? It hit it, it bumped into the apple accidentally. But the blob now of motion associated with the apple is not quite correlated with stop and start motion of cog, right? Which is the definition of self. Maybe it hit the apple kind of hard and cog stopped moving, which means the hand blob disappeared, but the apple blob rolled a little bit and then came to a stop. Aha. So cog concludes that there is other things out there that don't obey this relationship. I move and I see the blob. So Cog says, all right, I'm gonna call all that other stuff world. There is self and world. That's all I know at this point. So it's already classified two different patterns out there in the world, but very, very different from the way that a non-embodied pattern recognizer does. You can see in this cartoon that there's some other pieces of fruit that were placed in front of Cog. What happens if we continue this process? Cog continues to move about and bumps into some of these other pieces of fruit. What other kinds of sensor motor feedback loops can happen and what might Cog learn from it? Distinct blobs, right? So the world is not all the same thing, right? There are these things which have this shape, right? This round shape. And it turns out that when I bump into things that have this kind of shape, they keep their movement property for a couple of seconds and then it disappears. So I'm gonna call those things, I'm gonna invent a new word, round. And I'm gonna use round not just for the shape but again, for the relationship to self. If I hit round things, they move for a while even if I stop moving. What other kinds of things are out there? What kinds of adjectives might Cog discover by playing with these pieces of fruit? Like a, like a wall? He pushes against the wall to push him back from. Ah, okay, so uh, maybe a wall or the table itself. It pushes and now I'm sending motor commands but my blob is disappearing. My hand is no longer moving. So I'm gonna call these things walls or resistors or heavy objects. There are other things that are out there that when I come into contact with them, they don't start moving, I stop moving. What else? Uh, maybe squishy, something where like once he touches it, its shape is like permanently different. Absolutely, right? So the grapes and the banana are meant to be sort of hints here, right? 
Here's something that when I come in contact with it, the, the shape of the blob itself changes. I'm going to call that squishy. What else? Absolutely, right? There's some things that have different kinds of shapes. Apple-shaped things, banana-shaped things, grape-shaped things that are movable. So now COG is discovering ad adverbs, right? Movable. There are things that will move on their own. And there are other things like tables or nails that are partly hammered into the table that are not movable. COG may not be able to see immovable things because at the moment it can only see motion and non-motion. I think you start to get the, the idea here. So starting off at this empty state and then developing throughout, do the physical laws come out like uh, collision and momentum? Do they actually permeate through cog in that so you can actually see them defined? That's a great question, right? So let's turn that around. Could cog discover the concept of momentum and inertia by playing with objects on its table? What kind of sensor motor patterns would correlate with something like momentum? Well, let's take inertia. That's a little easier. Things in motion tend to stay in motion. Things uh, that are not moving tend to not move. Can COG learn about inertia? Why not, right? Pretty much everything here is beholden to the law of inertia, so yeah. Although it might be tricky for COG because that's all it sees, right? In order to really learn about a concept, you usually need positive and negative examples. So it would also have to see something that resists inertia. Right? Maybe a toy car or another robot or an animal, something that is in that sort of defies the, the dumb laws of inertia. But probably yes, right? So it's interesting to think about Cog about how far you could push this. If you gave Cog enough toys to play with, how much of its world could it learn about? Remember that it's learning about it by using its body. What we're learning in robotics is that by approaching the aspects of intelligence in an embodied way, we can often allow the machine to learn about its world using less data than if we don't. Imagine we trained our children by forcing them to sit and not move. We held their eyes still so they couldn't saccade their eyes, and we just supplied uh, YouTube to them and pages of data. That's how we trained our children. Probably not a good way to go, not very humane. Aside from the hum humane aspects of this, they probably wouldn't learn very well, right? Learning is very much an active process. Okay, that's pattern recognition. Let's move on to another building block of intelligence, planning ahead. An organism or a machine that cannot think ahead into the future is, for most people, considered less intelligent than something that can. Here's an example of a non-embodied planner, uh, Deep Blue, which beat Gary Kasparov at chess. Anybody remember when? It's kind of ancient history now. Huh? Very good, yes. So uh, Deep Blue won its first game against Kasparov in 96 in a match in 97, which shook the AI world and a lot of the popular culture at the time to its very core. Back, going back to 1956, the idea was we're going to make smart machines that are able to understand language, solve problems, do simple things, and eventually, in the far future, those really smart machines will be able to compete with us on the hardest things like chess and mathematics. One of the surprising things about the history of AI is that the problems that we got machines to solve first were the problems that we thought machines were gonna solve last. For most humans, chess and abstract mathematics is much more difficult than putting one foot in front of the other and navigating from point A to point B. It turns out that for machines, or at least for us building machines, chess is easy, walking very hard. It's interesting. Okay, so, um, and obviously uh, this pattern was, was uh, repeated just a few years ago with Go, right? Again, Go is more complicated than chess, but in many ways chess and Go are a lot easier than getting about in the real world. Why? Is it because chess has standard rules? Standard rules, right? They can be very pre precisely defined, 
We can precisely define how to play chess. We have to train a machine to figure out how to do it, but it's a precisely defined task. Again, if you try and define intelligence, for example, thinking ahead, understanding language, generating language, if you try and precisely define those things, it's very difficult to do. It's part of the reason why we can't get machines yet to do them. Okay, so the, the, uh, Deep Blue is a, a, a non-embodied planner. It thinks ahead. It's given the state of the board. It figures out what to do next and then proposes a move. Before we flip this around and look at an, an embodied approach to planning, we're going to pause for a moment, take a little bit of a divergence into yet another cognitive building block, and this one is quite controversial, free will. Okay, so um, most people would argue that if we want an animal or a human or a machine to act intelligently, it has to be able to decide on its own what to do next. Most people would argue that's somehow tied up with free will. So let's talk about free will for a moment. A bunch of psychologists in the early 1980s came up with this ingenious experiment, took a bunch of human subjects, brought them into the lab, and they instrumented on their scalp EEG sensors, stands for electroencephalography. EEG sensors are able to pick up uh, neural signals emanating from the surface of the brain. They can't get at the signals that are in the center of the brain, but most of our thinking, mo most of the interesting thinking that humans do occurs on the surface of the brain. So EEG uh, sensors are pretty good for that. The human subjects were also instrumented on their fingers with electromyography sensors or EMG sensors, which pick up muscle twitches. Okay. The subjects were then placed in front of a clock and there was a moving red dot that was moving around the face of the clock. The human subjects were asked to watch the red dot and at a certain point in time decide to move their finger and then actually move their finger. Pretty simple experiment for the human subjects at least. So the moment that the subjects moved their finger, it was picked up by the EMG signal. So imagine we got a whole bunch of different human subjects. They all choose to move their fingers at different times. It doesn't really matter, but that's the flag that we're gonna point, plant in the timeline. For that person, they twitched their finger at exactly that point. And if the researchers then went back in time 200 milliseconds earlier to the finger twitch, there was a consistent EEG pattern. So for, the same, for one human subject, when they did this multiple times, whenever that subject chose to move their finger, they had a particular pattern that showed up in their brain 200 milliseconds earlier. That pattern was consistent across human subjects, but of course the particular EEG pattern that was seen for different human subjects was different, like your your fingerprints, everybody's is different. The thing that was consistent across all of them was this pattern 200 milliseconds earlier, which corresponded more or less with the exact point in time that the human subjects reported, that's when I decided to move my finger. So everything looked like it was going according to plan. People were looking at the clock, deciding to move, and two-tenths of a second later, their finger moved, which is about the amount of time it takes for a decision to get to the muscles. Everything seemed to make perfect sense. So far, so good. Then this happened. They went further back into the data, 300 milliseconds earlier than the subjects reported that they had decided to move, and there was another consistent pattern every time the same subject did this experiment. That pattern that was seen 300 milliseconds earlier was not seen at different points in the timeline. So this was a very puzzling result. It's very controversial. Many people have replicated this result. Some people have reported to disprove this result. There's a whole literature that's grown up about, around this, this experiment. For our purposes today, what the Libet experiment shows is that thinking about thinking is misleading, or in other words, introspection is dangerous. All of the human subjects who took this experiment and all the human subjects that have taken versions of this are sure 
If you ask them, I decided at this time to move my finger. But it seems that their brains had actually decided to move their finger 300 milliseconds earlier than they were aware of it. If you weren't aware that you had made the decision to move your finger, how can it be a free choice? Strange. Okay, my purpose today again is not to convince you that you don't have free will. Whatever you believe, the answer seems to be more complicated than one would expect. It's just a reminder that especially when we're working in AI and we're trying to implement the various building blocks of cognition into our machines, we have to be careful. The way it feels like we do something, like for example, sitting down at a chessboard and planning out our moves in our head, is maybe not the way that we learned to plan in the first place. So the way something feels is maybe not the way that we should go, that shouldn't necessarily guide the way that we build it into machines, right? You all sat there passively and hopefully recognized Marilyn Monroe without having to get up and push against the screen or the projector, which is good news because there's nothing to push against anyways. But where did your ability to do this come from? Most of us spent the early years of our life playing with blocks and pushing against pretty much everything that was in our environment, grabbing it, putting it in our mouths, biting on it, acting on the world. Maybe those sensor feedback loops paved the way, they were the ground, they laid the foundation for your later ability to sit quietly, recognize Marilyn Monroe, play a good game of chess. You have to be careful about where these abilities actually came from. Okay, so that's enough about uh, free will, but just keep this in the back of your mind. Thinking about thinking is misleading. So let's go back to planning for a moment. Back in the uh, 19, late 1960s, a bunch of roboticists said, well, I know how planning works. I, uh, class ends, I look at the door, and I create a mental map of how to get from where I am to the door and leave the room. So let's build that into Shaky the Robot. So Shaky, as you see here, was actually pretty amazing at the time. They had computers on board the robot. Shaky had a rangefinder and a television camera. Shaky would scan uh, his environment. And these are not cartoons from Shaky's simulator, but would basically create an internal map of the obstacles. Shaky would then be told, uh, leave the room. Shaky would then plan a route in its head in the simulation it had created about how to e exit the room without bumping into any obstacles. And Shaky would start up and would shake and would move one inch and then come to a stop. Scan the room again, update its mental model, update its simulation, update its, its route, move again, come to a stop. And given a few days, Shaky could make its way out of the room. Before you laugh, remember this is the 1960s. There were some serious technological challenges at the moment. But Shaky was also intellectually flawed. Why? Shaky took a long time to leave the room because of the technological limitations, but also because thinking about thinking had misled these researchers about the nature of planning. What's the problem here? Uh, it's recalculating. It's it's recalculating a lot of its map. Does it need to, right? Who knows? If you're sitting stationary in a relatively complex environment, if I want to leave the room, do I need to model the details of what you all are wearing? Not really. So I can tell myself, all right, ignore all the clothing in the room. But what about all these other objects? Maybe I should ignore those. The lights, maybe I should ignore those. The carpet. Uh, maybe the carpet details do matter. I don't know. There's a lot of thinking that I might get wrapped up in that is irrelevant. So in the 1980s, uh, Rod Brooks, another big figure in the history of AI, turned this idea on its head and came up with subsumption architecture. We'll end with subsumption architecture today. In this case, we have obstacle sensors, little bump sensors which are connected directly to the motors. And if anything touches the robot and bumps the bump sensors, that immediately causes changes 
to the motors. The, the robot will rotate away from the, the bump sensor that was bumped. If neither of the bump sensors are being bumped, if the robot isn't touching anything, then this circuit goes quiet and the audio sensors take control of the motors. They subsume the control of the motors. If the robot hears something nearby, like a barking dog, then the audio sensors will cause the motors to turn away. If it's quiet and there's no obstacles around, it will turn towards the light, exactly like the aggressor does. If the robot is following the light and suddenly one of the bump sensors fires, the bump sensor subsumes or takes control of the motors instantaneously. So the things that are at the lower levels of subsumption architecture are more important. They're more urgent than things above. So as long as there's nothing urgent going on, light or audio can take control of the motors. If something urgent happens like a bump, those bump sensors immediately take control. You can imagine each layer in the subsumption architecture as being a Breitenberg vehicle. Bump sensors with contralateral connections will make sure that if it's bumped on the left, it turns away to the right and vice versa. Yeah? Okay. This was an idea that was proposed in the 1980s. It's a simple circuit, like Breitenberg vehicles. And it turns out you, if you put this in wheeled robots, they work pretty well. They can turn uh, towards the light, away from obstacles. Starting in the 1990s, Rod Brooks spun off a company and started to produce robots with subsumption architecture in them commercially. It was a huge success. What's the company and what's the product? iRobot. iRobot is the company and the Roomba. So if you have a Roomba at home, it's running this inside. We will stop there today. You have a quiz due uh, tonight. Undergraduates, you're working on assignment two. Grad students, you're working on assignments three and four. You will have a guest lecturer on Thursday. I will see you again next Tuesday. Thank you.